to start. Maybe there's. Uh, let me correct a mistake from yesterday. The normal density function looks like this. I missed the two and the sigma here yesterday, just to inform you. Okay. I forgot what it looked like. So we, we need to, to let right be right and wrong be wrong, I think. Okay, today we're going to talk about scheduling. Scheduling is basically about sorting stuff. Finding sequences and potentially this is an important field in event management or event logistics if you like because in many situations uh, sequencing or sorting actions or people or both is important. You can think about a football league where you obviously have to sort the matches in one way or the other. Typically you do this statically as we say that you do it without changing it so you cannot define the whole season from day one. Of course you can do this dynamically, kind of observe what's happening and then reschedule. And uh, if you follow Norwegian football on TV, you probably observe that there is a certain element of rescheduling. You kind of change dates, certain teams move from playing on a Friday into a Sunday and that kind of stuff to kind of fit with the TV schedule. So there are kind of uh, at least two different scheduling problems here. The, the one is, uh, is kind of given that you know which teams are playing each other on a certain weekend, how to schedule that on various days. Typically to maximize TV viewers uh, on, on the TV stations. And these other problems which is kind of related to which teams should play the other teams at each round. And of course you, you would kind of try to do this perhaps in a way where you, you take uh, certain constraints into consideration. For instance in Norway we, we tend to have uh, certain rules stating that uh, the biggest and best teams normally get the home mat match on the 16th of May to kind of maximize the number of audience uh, and, and this is not an obvious problem how to solve basically uh, and as it could be different objectives it could be related to doing things efficiently uh, at low cost or high income profit wise or it could be trying to influence the number of spectators uh, typically uh, through a, a whole season uh, and uh, th there is a lot of uh, constraints you have to take into consideration it kind of resembles the problem you have at a university or a college when you have a time schedule of various topics and you need to find which topics should be taught at each day and so on. Okay. Again, there is a certain sequence which is defined and this definition of these sequence have impacts both for the students as well as for the school. Okay. And it's, it's kind of on balancing these impacts in various ways which uh, typically is uh, scheduling. Uh, uh, concept. Uh, also in events of course uh, scheduling artists should you have the best artists in the end of a festival or in the start of a festival or spread them around and uh, this kind of stuff. Okay, It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not obvious how it should be done. It depends uh, on the type of festival you have, the type of artist you have and a lot of things will have to be taken into consideration. So, so this concept of scheduling is uh, relevant in events, uh, but of course it's also relevant in general classical logistics. In many cases we link it in logistics up to machines. So we think that okay we have this product which we want to produce and we have made some decisions on our machine park. So we have kind of decided that we have these and these machines and then based on our product definitions uh, these products they have to go through these machines in given sequences. Uh, some products may have to go through all machines, other products may have to go through a subset of the machines and so on. Okay. Uh, and in that sense uh, th the idea of the problem then is to try to kind of sort these jobs, to make a sort of them, achieving various efficiency targets. It could be related to the time you use of the process, which is the, perhaps the most normal target, trying to, to do things as fast as possible. 
But there could also be other type of objectives. It could be related to, to, to certain constraints imposed outside, for instance, that there are so-called due dates, meaning that certain uh, of these jobs will have to be finished at times different than other jobs. And then you can get tardiness, or you can get uh, jobs being too late. Okay, so so and, and that adds another dimension to to possible objectives. So so one of the things which kind of differs here, uh, both in logistics as well as in event planning, is that the kind of objective we look at, the the function we want to maximize or minimize, is not as obvious as normal. Normally we kind of minimize total costs in logistics. Here it's not that obvious what we should optimize on. We will talk a little bit about this uh, general structure of these type of problems. We will talk about kind of two extremes of these type of problems. Something is called a, a, a flow shop, which is the simplest situation, and a more complex situation, which is referred to as a job shop. I don't know if you know these terms already. No, you haven't heard it. Okay. We talk a little bit about flow time and make span, which is kind of the, the classical targets here to optimize on and some of the, should we say, practical sorting methods, which we are kind of used to see in practice. These practical sorting methods have grave impact on the efficiency of our problem. Uh, actually, no matter what kind of objective we introduce. And finally, we will use our toolbox to try to formulate a linear programming version of these kind of problems. We will look at the, the diff most difficult one, uh, not a general, but a special example in, in, in the form of a, a job shop problem. So, so that is the plan for today. Okay. Uh, when we deal with this in logistics, as I said, we kind of uh, describe it through machines. Um, so, we have a problem description. Defining that we have a set of jobs, let's call them N. These are jobs, or if you like, um, parts of a production process. Okay, A certain job could be painting a car, another job could be uh, manufacturing the engine, another job again could be installing the engine, for instance. Okay, so you, you can kind of understand what we think about here. And then we assume that we have M machines. So the idea here is that we have a set of jobs, and there is a kind of rule telling us what is needed for these jobs to be fed into a set of machines to kind of end up with final products. It could be a single product, or it could be many different products. Typically, it would be different products, okay? Especially if you uh, run into a job shop, shop situation, which we will return to. Uh, so, we, we kind of need something here. We need some input related to, what should we call it? Uh, legal job sequences. in addition to these data here. There's some data here related to, to how many jobs we have, what kind of structure they have, and the same for the machines, and there must be some kind of recipe here defining which jobs need to be at different machines and what kind of sequence we need to put them in. Okay. And we need some optimizing cr criteria. And in this way of uh, looking at it, it's typically related to some kind of time efficiency, to, to do things fast. You want to do it efficient. Uh, presumably, then there is some kind of underlying assumption that doing things fast is kind of less costly, in a sense. Okay? Uh, so, so that is kind of the underlying idea. So, so it's really not impossible to do a direct cost minimization, here, but that's not as easy to do, okay? Kind of converting these time saves into real costs is not obvious. There's a lot of fixed costs around related to having a set of machines and so on. So, so in many cases, you kind of try to, 
to, to opt optimize by including time efficiency as your objective. Now, if we look at a so-called flow shop, as I said, that is the kind of simplest situation. Uh, and here you have a set of jobs, J1, J2, up to Jn. And all these jobs are going to be fed into a set of machines. Okay? But these machines are organized in a special way in a flow shop. They are organized in a serial manner. Okay? So you fed the jobs in, in machine one, then they move into machine two, and they kind of keep on moving through these line of machines until the final machine, MM. This is what we commonly refer to as an assembly line, isn't it? Some Rebond innovation, okay, you, you kind of fed something in and there's people standing doing their jobs, okay, along this line. So these are people, or it could be actual machines. So this is a kind of a, a simple situation, but of course we can, we can extend it and kind of look at a more complex way of arranging our production facility. So if we move to a more general situation, we tend to call that a job shop. I don't know why they use shop here, but okay. So it's characterized by a situation where not all, all jobs need M operations, okay? In this case, of course, each job must run through all M machines, so you can have a situation where certain of these jobs can kind of skip certain of the machines. And some jobs could kind of need multiple operations on a single machine. You have to take it out and feed it back again, okay? So it could be situations where you need multiple operations. on a single machine. And of course, typically, it could be different sequencing demands here. So one job could need to kind of access machine two before machine one, at the opposite for another job, okay? To kind of generalize. So you can kind of think of this, uh, maybe something like this. Um, I can try to draw it. Let's take the flow shop out. And try to look at a kind of illustra illustrative example for a job shop. So if job one should be processed now, it should kind of start with machine one. Uh, maybe it should kind of skip machine two and move into machine three at the next stage. So you start here. Then you move here, and then you move back here, for instance. Maybe we should put some arrows here to kind of define the float. And it could end on M, M here. Going from that on up here, maybe another round there, if you like, okay? Before it's finished. While another job could have a completely different uh, running through structure here. It could say... Could start at the end, basically, if you like. Could start going in here, moving to M3, moving into M2, going from M2 into M1, and then going back into M2 before it kind of finishes. Okay, so you see this kind of opens up uh, quite a different. Uh, uh, Structure. And of course, modern production environments uh, would at least like to have this flexibility which kind of is linked to a job shop because then you can kind of use a given machine park to, to produce different products by using your, your machines in different ways. Now, when we started our logistics discussion, we kind of started at a fairly strategic level, talking about the aggregate production planning problem. Then we moved into lot sizing, which was kind of intermediate planning. But at this level, we kind of look at a day, for instance, or maybe a couple of days when we plan. So we're kind of at a very operational level now. Okay, we can talk about the strategic level and an operational level. Operational is kind of day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour decisions that has to be made. 
And in this situation, of course, if you have a, a situation like this, it could very well be that you do different things from one day to another, and even you do, do different uh, sequences within the day. Okay, so you have kind of a very fine-grained planning here when it comes to actually performing this. Okay, uh, a few topics. Flow time, what is that? A flow time is defined for each of the job. So it has a kind of subscript i, where i is our jobs, if you like. So there is one flow time for each job. It's defined as the time needed from the start of the first job until finishing job I. Okay, so uh, the first job we kind of start first and then it, it has a certain processing time, it's referred to it. Perhaps say what that is processing time. Processing time for job I is the time you need to process it, okay, for this given job. Time to process job I, okay. So this flow time concept kind of has a value for each of the jobs. The first one has its own processing time, the second one needs the first one to finish before he starts and then stops, then that's the processing time for job 2 and so on, okay? And of course given this, there's a set of these flow times and then we can of course compute an average, which is a typical term to look at in scheduling, the so-called mean flow time. The mean flow time is adding together all these flow times, dividing by the number of jobs. So, uh, let's write it down. The mean flow time is found by adding together over all jobs I flow time O job I and divide by all these I's, which is, uh, yeah, we have to say something. We had N jobs, didn't we? Yeah. I was in. 1 up to n, so we have to define by n here to, to find the average or mean flow time. And then we have this other term, referred to as make span. A lot of weird words here, if you haven't heard them before. Make span is a particular flow time is the flow time of the job finishes last. Okay. It's kind of the flow time for the last job. So the make span hence kind of tells us how much time we totally spend in our operation. Flow time for job ended last of all jobs. So it's kind of the total time spent in our problem. Or if you like, time needed to finish all jobs. Okay. 
This is a very normal optimization criteria. We want to minimize max band making, kind of executing our jobs as fast as possible. Okay, I think perhaps this will become a little bit easier if you look at an example. Okay? Uh, it's perhaps not so easy to kind of see what this really is about. So let's look at an example. Example. Comparing, should we say, manual scheduling or sequencing rules. We tend to use these words scheduling or sequencing uh, with the kind of same meaning here in this, this uh, subject here. So we look at a very simple situation. We have a single machine, one machine, M, and we have a set of jobs, J1, J2, up to some finish job here. And now we will look at some classical criteria. We have one criteria called F, C, F, S, first come, first serve, which is the kind of fair principle in some ways. And we will look at something referred to as SPT, or shortest processing time. And we will look at, uh, finally, number three, E, D, D, earliest due date. Okay. And what I want to demonstrate now is, of course, that by sorting these jobs differently, then these kind of uh, measures we, we, we should introduce, for instance, make span and flow time and that kind of stuff kind of changes. That is the idea. So you can kind of see how it runs. Uh, it turns out that this fairness principle of first come first serve is not a very good scheduling or sequencing principle. It kind of does not produce a very efficient solution. So if you think about patients in a hosp hospital, you very often tend to use these criteria, don't you? When you put them in a queue, they kind of keep this queue place and they move forward as the queue shortens. Uh, using the shortest processing time, basically in that sense, would mean that you should treat patients with the easiest disease first. Uh, this is not a common criteria in the health service, is it? And there is a good reason for that. What kind of reason is that? Yes. Yeah, if you, have, if, you have very, if you have a very severe disease, of course, you should be treated early in, in, in case you could die, okay? So, but from a queuing point of view, of course, it's, it's not so bad that people die, if you like, okay? It's, uh, it kind of runs fairly efficient. But it could have some interesting effects if you kind of look at health service in this way of thinking. And it has, to some extent, been discussed when it comes to how to organize health services in general, and especially maybe at operational theaters, where, where there is a lot of options on how to kind of sort patients which patients, patients to start with in the morning, which patients to end with in the afternoon. So maybe you should, you should in, in this sense, it could perhaps be a good idea to kind of put the open surgery operations late and kind of start with simple stuff like appendices or whatever, okay? So, so there is some learning here, but uh, let's just look at the example to, to get the feeling for what this is about, okay? Now, in order to, to look at this example, we have to have some more information. If we're interested in due dates, there must be some due dates for the jobs. And of course, if we're interested in shorter pro processing time, there must be some pro processing times for 
all the jobs. So we need one stream of, of numbers, which are due dates, which are the dates we really would like the jobs to finish. And while the processing times is the times needed to perform the job. So uh, this example is, we are, by the way, in chapter 8 in the textbook now. So we have the jobs here. And we have job 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we have some processing times here. So the first job here it takes 11 time units. Number 2 is a more demanding job, it takes 29. Number 3 is even more heavy, 31. And then 4 and 5 is kind of small here, easy jobs. And related to the first come first search service, the, the first job came first, two came second, and so on. So, okay, so this sort is the first come sort, so to speak. Uh, but we also need these due dates. And uh, the first job should ideally at least stop, be finished before time point 61. So we cannot. Think that we have a time scale here that starts at zero and then runs. So this first job should be finished before time period 61. The second one could, should finish earlier by 45, the third one by 31, and then there's 33 and 32. So you see these three final jobs should be ideally be finished early. Okay, now we can construct a table where we look at some measures, for instance, flow time and possible tardiness. Tardiness means too late jobs, okay? jobs you cannot end after these pres prescribed due dates. And see the consequence of applying different of these criteria. So let's do that. So, I, let's look at the first come, first serve criteria and see what's happening then. Of course, our sequence or schedule, if you like, would then be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, that is the first come, first serve structure. So, in that case, of course, we can calculate the flow time, can't we? It is straightforward because the first job now starts at time point zero and it uses 11 time units. So the flow time of the first job is simply 11. Now if we write down the due date here, which was 61, we see that we are very happy now because our first job, it finishes after 11 time periods, it should finish after 61. So this is okay. okay. We don't have any tardiness here. The tardiness is zero here. You're not too late with that job. Okay. Then we start our job 2. By the end of time period 11, it takes 29. So we have to take 29 plus 11 here to produce job 2's flow time, which would be 40. The due date was 45, so there is still no tardiness for the two first jobs. Job 3 will then start at the end of time period 40. It needs 31 time units to finish, and we end up finishing that job at time period 71. Okay. The due date is 31. So this is seriously late, isn't it? It's actually 40 time units too late. Just taking that one minus that one produces the tardiness. In general, we can say that tardiness could be computed by the following formula. If we take our flow time and C 
subtract the no yeah subtract the due date so we take this number and subtract this one then we get something here uh, alternatively we get nothing so we would like to maximize this formula don't you pick the biggest of these two numbers to produce you see either it's zero or it is the difference so we should maximize this one it's the maximum of this one and zero if we're interested in minimizing tardiness or some kind of average tardiness we may run into problems the reason for that is that this maximum function is not linear it's a non-linear function we cannot base all our thinking here of using linear functions it doesn't mean that we cannot handle non-linear non-linearity but we need to apply some tricks so the best or easiest way is to kind of keep linear but you see already here we introduce something which is nonlinear. A nonlinear function is a kind of function which kind of goes like this or have some kind of peaks. Okay, if you think about maximizing x and y, if this is x and this is y, of course maximizing here means picking this part which is the biggest one here and that part which is the biggest one here. So you see the resulting function here is not linear. It has a kind of a break point here. So this is an explanation why this is not a linear function. So already at this point we see that it's it may kind of impose some new problems for us when we want to optimize in with the with the toolbox we kind of have. But let's finish this example. Uh. Job 4 now starts at 71 and takes one time unit. That produces a finishing point at 72. Uh, the due date was 33. So again we get uh, uh, a bad uh, uh, tardiness here of 39, don't we? 72 minus 30 30 33 is 39. The fun job then starts at 72 it takes two time units, finishes at 74, should have been finished at 32, which produces a tardiness of 42. Of course, now we can compute the total tardiness if you like by just adding together. You can find the total lateness of all jobs. Just adding together here, that produces 80, yeah, 9, 11, 121, isn't it? Yeah. And we can also uh, compute, let me just write total here, okay? We can compute the total flow time. Of course, this is the main span, isn't it? 74. Agree? That's when the last job ends okay but we can compute average flow time if you like it by just adding together all these jobs uh, flow times and then we get uh, 268 so if you add together these numbers we get 268 we add together these numbers we get 121 of course these numbers say something about the efficiency of our sequence or our sorting of the jobs okay if we sort them differently typically we get different numbers here okay that would be something to look at And there are typically three criteria we look at here. Uh, they are not necessarily uh, the same, okay? So we can look now at mean flow time by taking 11 plus 40 plus 71 plus 72 plus 74 and divide by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that would produce 53.6. So the average flow time in this sequencing is 
and we could uh, construct the average tardiness, which is often is called tardiness, or the average complete late time for all jobs. That would be 121 over 5. We did compute that one already, didn't we? Which is uh, something like 24.2. And of course, if you like, we can kind of count up the number of jobs which are tardy here. Okay, there is these two are not too late. These three are too late. So we have three tardy jobs. These three criteria say something about efficiency. And depending on which one we kind of like to look at, it would uh, probably behave differently. So let's uh, keep on looking at our example and look at the shortest processing time case, okay? Now I'll just write these numbers up here. So I have the MFT, which is mean flow time, 53.6. I have the AT, average tardiness, which is 24.2. And this was the FCF S case, okay? And I have a number of tardy jobs. Hashtag TJ, okay? That was three in this case. So let me take these out and do the same thing with the shortest processing time criteria and see what the effect is. Uh, uh, the creative, oh, you probably have a feeling that it becomes more efficient, okay? So if you use shortest processing time at, as our sorting criteria, then job four spent the least amount of process processing time. It had a value of one. Okay, so then we start with job four. We move on with job five. Uh, then into job one, and then two, and then three. So now we have resorted based on sorting related to the processing time, and of course, the consequences now change. We have our flow time here, we have our due dates here, and we have our tardiness here. Okay, job four had a flow time of one, okay? The due date was 33, so there is no tardiness here. Job 5 had a processing time O2. 1 plus 2 equals 3. Uh, so it and it had a due date of 32, so there is still no tardiness. Job 1 had a processing time of 11, if you remember from the previous uh, figure here. So there is 3 plus 11, which is 14. And uh, the tardiness demand was 61, so still no tardiness. Okay. Now we already see that they have improved, haven't you? Because the, the three first jobs are not tardy at all, but the number three at this case kind of came late. Uh, now job two. And I think it had a 29 processing time. Okay, so it's 29 plus 14 which is 43, okay? The due date here was actually 45, so there is still no tardiness. And the job tree had, uh, I don't remember what did it have. It had a processing time of 31, you can see it there, okay? So it was, then we have to take 43 plus 31, which of course should be 74. The make span doesn't change here, obviously. We are just sorting, but the mean flow time changes and the, the possible lateness or tardiness changes. Of course, we can have situations where, where the make span change. If you want to optimize on the make span, you must have situations where it, it can vary. That depends on situations where you have a little slightly more complex than this. Okay. You know, have, uh, on a single machine, then it will be only a, a single make span, so to speak. Okay, uh, in this case, the due date was 31. And of course, now we get tardiness for the final job here, of 43. 
Again, of course, we can add together. And you see that the mean flow time will change here because it's getting far below what it had previously. And the tardiness now is 43. So in the case where you look at shortest processing time, the mean flow time is now 135 divided by 5, which turns out to be 27. So you see a major change from 53.6 down to 27, almost halving it. The average tardiness is 43 divided by 5. This number divided by 5, which is uh, 8.6 actually. Again, a major change from 24.2 down to 8.6. And finally, the number of tardy jobs here is only one, okay? Moving from 3 down to 1. So you see by this simple example, uh, a very big change in these measures when you reschedule your jobs. Okay, that is what this is about, okay? I think it's time for a break. Okay, 15 minutes.